Well, good morning. Thanks for joining with us. Please excuse the background noise. Um, the old folks home across the road have just started up their weekly karaoke, so I hope it's not too distracting. Uh, we're continuing our study in John's Gospel. We're in chapter 12 today, at the end of the chapter from verses 37 down to 50. The theme of the passage today is unbelief. Unbelievable unbelief. You know, sometimes in life we meet people and we are astounded, dumbfounded at their unbelief. Even when it comes to recent historical events, for example, the moon landings, there are people who don't believe that man has landed on the moon. Despite all the evidence, eyewitness accounts, the documentary film evidence, the fact that we have equipment on the moon that we communicate with, they just refuse to believe it. The same goes for the Holocaust. Again, despite eyewitness accounts from both survivors and even the perpetrators, the discovery of the actual death camps themselves, and again, documentary evidence, people refuse to believe that such evil took place. And we're left dumbfounded at people's unbelief. Here in John chapter 12, it's the unbelief of the people in Jesus. Just look at verse 37. Though he had done so many signs before them, they still did not believe in him. You know, we tend to marvel at people's belief in Jesus. The Gospels marvel at their unbelief. Why such unbelief? This is actually a turning point in John's Gospel. It marks the end of Jesus' public ministry. He will no longer make any public appearances. There will be no more teaching in public. Jesus has said all he wants to say. There will be no more signs, no more miracles. From now on, Jesus will, be, will meet in private with his disciples. And from there, he will go on to face the cross. But here at the end of chapter 12, and the closing verses of chapter 12, from verse 44 down, John gives us a climactic summary, if you like, of Jesus' public ministry. There are recurring themes in, in these closing verses, themes that John has visited time and again throughout his gospel. There is the theme of light and darkness, the theme of believing and rejecting. There is the theme of who Jesus is, the, the oneness with the Father, the equality of Jesus with God. The theme of his mission, Jesus says here that he had come to save the world and not to destroy, not to condemn or judge it. But there is here in this closing section a final appeal to believe. And Jesus makes this appeal in the form of three whoever statements. Let's look at the first one in verse 44. Jesus cried out and said, Whoever believes in me, believes not in me, but in him who sent me. He is, of course, referring to God. It's the oneness of Jesus with God the Father. The second one in verse 45. Whoever sees me, sees him who sent me. And then the third one in verse 47. Whoever hears my words and does not keep them. Whoever believes, whoever sees, and whoever hears. Whoever believes. You know, the Bible talks about believing in your heart. Romans chapter 10, verse 9. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart, one believes. And the Bible talks about your heart, truly really talking about your will, you know, submitting your will to, to the Lord Jesus, trusting him alone. Whoever sees, this is not seeing Jesus physically. It's about seeing in the sense of understanding, understanding who Jesus is, that Jesus is God. And that if you want to know God, you know him through believing in Jesus because Jesus is God. 
And then thirdly, whoever hears. Jesus says, whoever hears my words and does not keep them, he frames it in the negative. But the point Jesus is making is that believing is not just about surrendering your will, not just about understanding, it's about obeying, obeying his words. And so as Jesus' public ministry comes to a close, he makes this final appeal, an appeal to the, to the whoever to believe in him. Indeed, that's why John wrote this gospel. We've seen that Sunday after Sunday. As John brings his gospel to a close, he states his purpose in writing in chapter 20. He wrote these things that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. And John has taken us on a journey, has he not, through these first 12 chapters of his gospel. And of the many signs that Jesus performed, John has selected seven, seven signs that point us to who Jesus is. Beginning in chapter 2, when Jesus turned water into wine at the marriage, the wedding ceremony in Cana. Then in chapter 4, healing the nobleman's son. In chapter 5, healing uh, the helpless cripple. Then in chapter 6, the feeding of the 5,000 with five loaves and two fish. And all their bellies were filled and there were leftovers. Chapter 6, he walks on the water, he walks upon the sea. Then in chapter 9, Jesus opened the eyes of the blind man. And then in chapter 11, he raises Lazarus from the dead and brings him to life. Seven signs pointing us to who Jesus is. He is Lord. He is Lord over all. He is Lord over nature. He is Lord of life. He is Lord over death. Jesus transforms lives. These were clear, unmistakable signs pointing to who Jesus is. The evidence was clear. No more signs would be given save his cross and his resurrection. But though he had done so many signs before them, they still they still did not believe in him. Why such unbelief? Well, this takes us to the central theme of our passage. Unbelief. Unbelievable unbelief. There are two kinds of unbelief in our passage. Firstly, in verses 37 to 41, there is what I would describe as unbelieving unbelief. And then secondly, from verse, verses 42 and 43, there is believing unbelief. Now that sounds strange, but let's explain what we mean. Unbelieving unbelief. Look at verse 37 again. Despite the many signs, despite all the evidence, they still, still, they did not believe in him. You know, this was persistent unbelief. You know, they could have nipped round to, to Lazarus's house. I mean, Lazarus didn't live too far away in Bethany. And they could have spoken with Lazarus. You know, just relatively recently, Lazarus had died. He was dead and buried four days in the tomb. Now he was alive. You know, the e evidence was right there in front of them. But they chose not to see it. They chose to reject it. This unbelief also did not take Jesus by surprise. It was prophesied in the Old Testament. John here quotes two passages from the prophet Isaiah. Firstly, from Isaiah 53, you know, that wonderful passage about the suffering Christ, the suffering Messiah. Who has believed what he heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? You know, the arm of the Lord, it speaks of, of the power, the might, 
of the Lord, revealed through the signs that Jesus performed, and yet they didn't believe. John then quotes a second passage from Isaiah, from chapter 6. Now notice how John introduces that quotation from Isaiah in verse 39. He says, therefore, they could not believe. For again, Isaiah said. Now, this is very important. They wouldn't believe. But now in verse 39, they couldn't believe. They could not believe. What's the significance of this? What does it mean? Well, let's look at the quotation from Isaiah. He has blinded their eyes. It's speaking about God. The God has blinded their eyes and hardened their heart, lest they see with their eyes and understand with their heart and turn and I would heal them. Well, you might say, hang on a minute. This doesn't seem very, very fair. They can't believe because God has blinded their eyes. God has hardened their heart. God won't let them believe. Well, that's not true. In fact, nothing could be further from the truth. This is a a very important point to understand. This is a judicial blindness, a judicial hardening. They had received all the evidence they needed. There is no more evidence that could soften their heart towards Jesus or change their thinking or their understanding towards him. They had rejected every opportunity that God had given them to believe. They had persistently rejected. And their hearts had become hardened. And now God finally says to them, I accept your unbelief. I accept your rejection. And God fixes them in their unbelief. They are now permanently in unbelief. God is actually giving them what they want and they could not believe. It is a judicial blindness, a judicial hardening. It's actually a very sad and solemn truth. You know, that to persistently reject Jesus and his gospel, there is the danger that you harden your own heart. And that could eventually lead to God accepting your unbelief so that you become permanently hardened and blind to Jesus Christ and his gospel. It is unbelieving unbelief. But then there's a second type of unbelief, In verses 42 and 43, believing unbelief. Let's read uh, the verses. Nevertheless, many even of the authorities believed in him. But for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it. So that they would not be put out of the synagogue. For they loved the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. Here are folks many of whom are leaders among the people. Um, They are in positions of authority. And they get it. They see Jesus. They understand who Jesus is. He has all the credentials of Messiah. Only God could do the things that Jesus did. And they believe Jesus is the Messiah. But that's where their belief is stopped. It was an intellectual belief only. They would not confess Jesus Christ publicly. Now the Bible links confession, confessing with believing. We quoted Romans chapter 10 verse 9 earlier. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, you will be saved. Their believing stopped short. Why? Fear of man. They felt they had too much to lose in confessing Jesus Christ. They were frightened of being put out of the synagogue, of being excommunicated. 
and that would have been a big deal for them. They would have been ostracized within the community. And that's exactly what they did to the, to the blind man that confessed Jesus in chapter 9. And something else here too. They loved the glory of man more than the glory that comes from God. They loved something else more than Jesus. This is believing unbelief. Is that where you are in your life? Is fear keeping you from believing in Jesus Christ? Do you feel as if you have too much to lose from becoming a Christian? Or is there something else that you love more than Jesus? You know, the sad truth of it all is this, that all unbelieving, whether it's this believing unbelief, or whether it's the cold, hard rejection of unbelief, it all ends in the same place, the same hopeless place. And that is to stand before God and face him as your judge. That's what Jesus says in verse 48. The one who rejects me and does not receive my words has a judge. The word that I have spoken will judge him on the last day. Unbelievable unbelief. They had all the evidence, all the signs. How good are you at reading signs? You know, there's a key phrase in the passage, in the middle of the passage in verse 41. And it says about Isaiah that he saw his glory. He saw the glory of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the gospel. He is the Messiah. He is the only one who can save your soul. You have all the evidence. Will you see the signs? Will you see his glory? Will you believe in Jesus Christ? Thank you for listening. May God bless you.